So here we are back with Conversations That Matter in the wisdomfactory.net. I'm Heidi Hörnlein and I'm German and I'm living in Italy. And I created this um, online, how can we call that? Podcast, <laughs> video <laughs> podcast together with my American husband, uh, Mark Davenport. And before I met him, I didn't know a whole lot about America. But then I learned something about uh, the American mindset and how people live and how they see the world. And then while Mark was living here with me in Italy, he started to see his own country with different eyes. And he saw many things which he had believed before they are really great and really good. And he became a little bit doubtful if there's everything right in the way that he believed for such a long time. Now, unfortunately, he's dead, uh, but I try to continue with the series. And today, I hope I will learn a little bit more about America. I have here with me John Taylor, and he wants to talk me, to me about a, to him, very important topic. And when I watched the suggestions, the video he sent to me, I realized there's another thing I didn't know. And the goal of this conversation is to allow you to know a little bit more about things which might just be under the surface going on and you have no idea. So without further ado, I don't know how we shall call that, but we will see <laughs> later. <laughs> Rediscovering something about America maybe. <laughs> But before that, we, uh, you, thank you that you are here, that you called on thank me you. and asked if we can do the conversation, which I'm happy to do. And tell me a little bit about you, about your background, and then we sort of circle around and come to the topic, okay? Sure, yeah, perfect. So I, I actually connected with you through the, an email that you sent. I've been, I've been on your email list for a while. Uh, and you sent an email uh, saying something along the lines of, you know, have Americans forgotten their roots? Um, you know, look at these refugees that are that are out there in the world. And that really kind of caught my attention um, because I've been doing work um, around immigration, um, you know, and I've been doing things that uh, have kind of opened my eyes to the immigration system here in the US and you know I've lived in the US my entire life uh, I really didn't have a good idea though of how immigration worked um, until you know within maybe the last four years I would say three or four years and in that time uh, I've been trying to to help uh, interpreters that I worked with in Iraq uh, I was in the military and uh, I've been trying to help them get out of uh, the situations that they're in and get them to safety. Um, but also it, on a more kind of happy, fun uh, side of things, I also host concerts and um, I, I'm bringing in musicians, international musicians from all over the world. And what I'm seeing is that immigration policies have really changed here within the last few years as to where it's almost impossible for certain people to be able to enter the United States. And so the kind of the culmination of all of these things has forced me to, to look a little bit deeper and to see what's really going on. And, uh, you know, what I've found is really kind of disturbing to me. Um, mm -hmm. You, you know, what you touched on in your email was, you know, you know, look, the United States is, is, is a country formed from immigrants. Um, you know, that's how the country was formed. And so, uh, you know, thinking that now, um, you know, it, it's very difficult for an immigrant to come to the U.S. Um, it, it almost seems like something that is unbelievable. Um, you know, especially for someone living here and, you know, you're, you're taught the history. So, you know, living here in the U.S., you're, you're taught the history of the United States and, and how it was formed and how the immigrants came here 
and you know they they gave up everything that they knew in their home countries to come to some other place uh and mainly they were they weren't doing it just for pleasure they were leaving for a reason they had they had an, they had a reason why they needed to flee wherever they were living yeah. and you know it, i i think that that still is happening in the world but i think that uh the the opportunities for for people to be able to enter the United States right now are very limited. Even, even on a, um, even, you know, like I said, even just like for musicians who want to, to tour here and come to the U S it's actually extremely difficult. Um, which, you know, you would think <laughs> would be something that would be, you know, be, would be encouraged and would be very simple. And, uh, it's, it's actually not. And so, um, yeah, like I said, I, I've kind of, in doing the work that I've been doing, I, I've just more or less been forced to open my eyes to what's going on. And um, it, yeah, it's kind of disturbing. Yeah, I actually didn't think so much about America because since uh, Mark is death, dead, I sort of don't get so much information anymore about America. <laughs> I was thinking about Europe. How is Europe uh, uh, um, uh, behaving? And Actually, half of Europe went to America as refugees, and <laughs> right. they have forgotten, you know. And in the last, uh, in the Second World War, so many people tried to flee to uh, also to America. America took a lot of people, but as I understood later, they needed to have already somebody there who guaranteed for them. So if you were just somebody without any friend or family member in America, you couldn't just go. Uh, and be a refugee in America, even if you were in danger of life in, in, in Germany, uh, you know. So it seems to have always been difficult to be accepted in other countries. And um, even if America accepted a lot, you know, they were a refugee country, as you said, not a, a, a migration country, as you said. <laughs> um, we in Europe, we have forgotten that once we needed, many of us needed to flee and needed somebody to, to open uh, the gates, you know. And this was in the connection, the, the, the email you talked about, that was uh, about a, a woman in South Africa. She is living in South Africa as a refugee of the war, of the genocide 22 years ago in Rwanda. And she is still living as a refugee. Obviously, she cannot go back because that was really a horrible time. And I saw her presentation of this event on a, in a conference. And I really was in tears because, you know, as always, you don't, you hear something and think, ah, oh, yeah, let's let them kill each other. But when then you get personal contact with people who have gone through such a thing, then you cannot say mm, and look away. Uh, it's just, you know, it touches you. So uh, you talked me, uh, to me about this, this Iraq war, which from my perspective of today was completely illegal. Uh, but, you know, I don't know what you think about it. We didn't talk about that before. But anyway, it happened. And then there were people who some way had the personal connection, found personal connection to American soldiers like, like you. Yes. And uh, then uh, offered their help for translating. Because if you want to talk with somebody and find a, maybe a peaceful solution, you, you have to be able to talk. And you have, when you don't know the language, you need a, 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 an interpreter. And then America left out. And the interpreters <laughs> were there, and now they were traders right. in their own country. And then nobody takes care of them, you know. You just don't think about how, you know, people who helped, in this case, the Americans, and probably also their own country, because they tried to, to create understanding by interpretation, and then afterwards are stigmatized as... Um, traitors, you know, and maybe need to be killed or whatever, the families even um, uh, impacted a lot. And 
then America, yeah, somebody they have taken, but not really, don't care a lot, you know. And as I've heard also in other circumstances that actually, yeah, there are veteran uh, programs in America, but really a whole lot of care is not for people who have given their life and their psychic, uh, psychological health to a cause which were legitimate or not, this is, we don't want to discuss that now, but they have given it and then they come back home and then uh, now go on with your life. <laughs> Nothing happened, you know. That's just a unhuman way of, you know, uh, you see, I'm getting excited because I'm... Yeah, it, it, yeah I understand. And that's why, <laughs> and that's why I'm talking about it. <laughs> yeah, now I give yeah. over to you. I have, I have, evaporated my, <laughs> my pressure on that. <laughs> now, tell me a little bit more about what you are about to do, what you are doing, and uh, what you see as a possibility, and how maybe somebody, people who listen to that could help. Sure. So I'll, I'll give you a little bit more background on, on myself yeah. and kind of how I got involved in all this. So yeah. I was in the military. Um, and I, I joined the National Guard, um, which, uh, you know, up until um, the time that I got called up for deployment, I, uh, you know, the National Guard historically had only been seen uh, dealing with domestic issues, uh, you know, floods, earthquakes, riots, uh, things within the country, um, never deploying, you know, to, for a foreign conflict. Um, and so when I, when I received the message that, um, I was being called to go to Iraq, it came as a huge shock to me. Uh, you know, I, I had never, when I signed up, I'd never thought that that would even be a possibility. Um, <clears throat> but you know, one thing led to another and I, and I find myself in Iraq, uh, I ended up spending a year there. And like you said, while I was there, uh, you know, in order to interpret, in order to, to speak with the people locally, uh, we had to have an interpreter because we were given um, very minimal language training. Uh, and a lot of the training that we were given wasn't applicable to the areas where we were working because uh, especially when you, when you get in the rural areas of, of Iraq, uh, it's almost like a tribal sort of, uh, a living situation where uh, there's small groups of people and they have their own communities that are self-contained and uh, they also have their own dialects. Uh, yeah. And um, <clears throat> because, because of that, it, it's, it's impossible to communicate with uh, those people if you don't have an interpreter. Uh, so an interpreter was very important to what we were doing uh you know we could have never done the things that we were doing what what were you doing there in the in the rural area sure well uh we 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 were in all sorts of different places over the the course of the year um but we were basically in the, in that entire year we were assigned to do uh what are called combat patrols meaning um we would go out and we would have an area that we were responsible for keeping safe <laughs> uh almost like a police officer goes out on a patrol where they you know they go out throughout a city and and they look for things that are maybe uh not going quite right um and intervening um so it was never really like an offensive sort of mission it was it was more just kind of going out um having a presence in in these areas that we were responsible for and then reacting to um, things as they came up. Um, yeah, you know, so you, it, need, you need to understand what people say and you, they need to understand what you say. So, sure. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If, I mean, if, if, <laughs> if you can't communicate with the people you're interacting with, um, first off, you can't be accepted by them. Uh, you, they, they have no idea what you're doing. You know, having a, a third country's, military coming in and occupying your country <laughs> you know it, it, it's it's a very foreign thing to a lot of people um you know i don't think I, the average person i don't think can imagine what that would be like but 
then also not speaking the same language uh, adds another level of, of complexity to the situation. And so um, long story short, the, the interpreters were very, very important to what we were doing. We, there's absolutely no way we could have done what we were doing without them. And, and these interpreters, they were with us side by side with everything we did, you know, during firefights, during ambush, car bombs, everything that we did, everything that we went through as soldiers, they were there with us side by side. Uh, the only difference was is that, you know, they didn't have the uniform on um, and they had no promises of, um, you know, the U.S. taking care of them. And and that's and that's really the problem that I have, and, and and the problem that I'm seeing now is is you know these these people made huge huge sacrifices. Some made much more of a sacrifice than than the U.S. troops. I mean, I, I would say that really um, these individuals put themselves and their friends and their family in more danger than than the average soldier did. Um, because they, you know, they were not allowed to live with the troops. Um, they were forced to live out in public, meaning that, uh, you know, in order for them to work with us, they had to come and go each day. And they would they would come, and then they would they would work their time, and then they would leave. But in that in that coming and going, it was easy for some in an insurgent or someone uh, to see them and, and realize that that person was working with the U.S. They knew who they were and it would it'd be easy for them to follow them, to see where they were living, to see where their friends and their family are at. And because they were such an asset to us, um, I mean, many of these these interpreters lost their lives, not in the, in the line of duty with the troops, but as they were... Um, you know, coming and going back to their families, um, because it was a very easy thing for for them to be, like I said, to be seen coming and going. You know, the the, the location of the bases that we were working from was no secret, and so, you know, the insurgents absolutely knew where we were at. And so uh, there were already then uh, the suspicion that they are traitors, that they would uh, uh, collaborate with you, and and then. Uh, you know, against their own country. Absolutely, and so and actually, so they were. You know, and I guess another piece of that is that maybe a lot of people don't know is that um, I would say the majority of the insurgents that we were dealing with in Iraq were not from Iraq. Most of those those the, the people that were trying to do harm to the U.S. were not actually from Iraq. They were um, from other areas, Syria or uh, you know some of those outlying countries they were coming in um, most of the time you know if, if there was someone from Iraq that was trying to cause us harm it was because they were being paid money by one of these insurgent groups um, to for example uh, you know uh, organize like a, a suicide bomb or, or something like that um, where they're being paid money, you know, their family is being paid money for them to go out and do one of these malicious acts. It, it wasn't a lot of Iraqi people that were that were trying to to cause the U.S. harm. Um, but what was what the problem was was that you know these these people who were were interpreters, they were kind of they were kind of. Uh, seen as traitors not only from the Iraqi people uh, but then also from the insurgents so they weren't liked by any either of those groups of people uh, because they really were two different groups of people the like I said the insurgents really were normally from third countries they weren't from Iraq a lot of them um, very few were from Iraq I would say and so uh, it that put them in a very dangerous position because they also, like I said, in, in, in doing this, they put themselves, their friends, their family, everyone in danger. And, and they were kind of just, just out there on their own. You know, the only so, ally that they would have would be the U S and, and then, you know, 
when we left, we abandoned almost all of those interpreters. There, there were very few lucky ones that were uh, assisted by the U.S. who were able to flee, uh, but the majority are still there and still in hiding. Mm -hmm. After all that time. I'm wondering, uh, you had obviously contact with them. What made them do such a dangerous job? Just the fact that there are no jobs around and that they happen to be good in English and find a good job to feed the family? Yeah, and that's a great question. Uh, I, I think there's different motivations, but, but one of them is that, yes, there are very few jobs. Um, there were ver very few jobs at the time, and I think still even now, there are very few jobs. Um, so it, for a lot of these people, it was seen as a way to um, support their families. Um, and, the, and it was seen as a better alternative than what the insurgents were offering them because there was really, there were more or less three different options for someone trying to, to earn a living. Um, you know, one would be taking money from the insurgents, one would be taking money from the US, and then the third option would be figuring something out there within the country locally, um, you know, but the, the economy was really non-existent. There was really no economy. Uh, it, it was a very uh, corrupt uh, economy, uh, and it still is, you know, a lot of it based on uh, bribery and, and just uh, very, you know, n not, uh, not what you, you would consider, you know, a normal sort of an economy. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that that was part of it was that um, just the situation being the number of available things that someone could do for money, um, that I think that played into it. And then, you know, then I think that there are, for the most part, a lot of these interpreters also bought into the idea that, um, you know, that those troops that were there were trying to help them. And, and you know, if you look at the big picture, you know, I, I don't really want to get into kind of the, the, the purpose of, of why we were there, because I, I don't think that that, uh, you know, I, I don't, I didn't align with me, but I think that the individual troops who were there, for the most part, did care about what they were doing and the people that they were interacting with. I think that, you know, everyone that I came in contact with, they were trying to do, you know, as much good as they could while they were there, um, despite the reasons why they might have been there. Um, and so I think, you know, a lot of these interpreters would see this and then they would say, wow, you know, th these guys are coming, trying to help my country. I want to try to help them, help my country, help my family. And um, they were, you know, they were buying into this. And so I think that, you know, that's, that. those were the main motivations for why someone would do that. But, you know, again, I think it's almost unimaginable for the average person um, as to the situations that these, these people face. Um, you know, again, the, their country being at war, being occupied by another military um, and having violence and, and chaos going on constantly, having that being a normal thing. Um, and, and so it's almost, it's almost, like I said, it's almost unimaginable, I think, for, for the average person to, to understand um, what life would be like in one of those situations and, and how, you know, someone would be willing to eat to give uh, and, and, and to make so many sacrifices um, yeah. for a cause that, you know, um, they may or may not believe in, you know? <laughs> so that's, that's, yeah, it's a complicated answer, in yeah. a complicated situation. A yeah. good one. And you know what I understood uh, learning more about Americans, that unless they have a real experience like you have, about situations in other countries, they have no idea. No idea how, how other countries are. They think they are the standard and everywhere is, it's like them, you know, and, uh, and it's not the case. I mean, when I heard, for instance, um, the brother of my ex late husband, they came to see us and they live about, I don't know, maybe 100, 200 miles from Canada. They didn't have a passport. They never had a passport in their life. 
So they, since Canada at a certain point needed to be a passport, they were not even there. So, <laughs> you know, this is just, how can you know about the reality in the, in the, in the world when, yeah, maybe you listen to the, the, the main news, but in the news, I mean, that's not really reality, what, what they tell you unless you go and see how it is in other countries. And for me, for instance, living in Italy, which is not yet a third world country, but not, not like America and, and Germany. And yeah, let's say it's pretty good. But then I went to South Africa and saw, saw how it's there. I thought, oh, wow. Some of our kids in Germany who think everything is going downhill, everything is bad, everything, they should go in other countries. They, they would <laughs> exactly. have other ideas to spend their time with, you know. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Mamma mia. So I think what you are doing is a great work to, to, to raise consciousness of Americans because I really found out, and that's what I, together with Mark, uh, understood, that he opened his mind to, oh, it's really, and he was in other countries before, so he had already a, a better, let's say, overview, but who has never left the country? How can you know how it is somewhere else? And how can you care? Because you cannot, you, it's, it's an excuse for those people. You cannot really imagine how it is to live in different circumstances until you were really there and saw it with your own eyes and maybe lived it for a few days as you did. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. And, you know, I, I, you know, so I guess a little bit more of my story, I, you know, I was in the military, I was there um, from 2004 to 2005. And uh, I came home. And I just, you know, I never really thought about a lot about those interpreters that we had left behind at the time. Um, you know, I did, th I did think about them. But I just assumed that maybe they didn't want to leave or I assumed that, you know, maybe they, they were killed or, you know, I, I, I never really knew what had happened to them. And so I, I didn't, you know, although I was thinking about it, I wasn't really actively um, looking into it a lot. And so um, I had one friend um, who's featured in that video who was an interpreter who um, he, he was one of the lucky ones who was actually able to come here to the U.S. And he, he came here in 2007. Um, I want to say he was like one of 50 interpreters that year uh, who was given a special immigration visa. And, and really, you know, if you ask him his story, it's, it's an amazing story because, you know, he had worked uh, with the U.S. at that time for um, about three years. And he... You know, in that time, he had been um, at attempted to be assassinated many times, uh, you know, shot at, his car blown up, his house burned, um, his, his father was actually killed uh, in front of his mother. Um, his, uh, one day he was gone um, working with the U.S. and while he was gone, these insurgents it came looking for him and... Uh, but he wasn't there, but his, his, his family was at, at home and um, they, they took his father and told his, his mother that, uh, you know, they were, they were going to kill his father because of what the work that his son was doing and, and killed him right there in front of his mother. Um, and so, and, you know, and, that, and that's a very kind of common story around this. I mean, as it, 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 sad as it is, it's, 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 it's almost unimaginable, I think, to, to the average person. But he was one of the lucky ones because he was actually able to come to the U.S. and he's been here ever since. He's got uh, his citizenship now. Um, it took a long time. But even then, um, you know, hearing what he had to go through in order to come here, even though he, you know, even though he was one of the lucky ones who was granted that visa, um, it wasn't easy, you know, he, so he was granted this visa. And, and the only reason that happened was he just happened to be at the right place at the right time. And there was a general there who, who signed off on his application, um, which, you know, most interpreters never probably met a general, 
they, they probably never came in contact with a general. And so uh, having that be one of the requirements for the program, um, in addition to a bunch of other requirements, I mean, that, that alone eliminates many possible applicants um, to be able to, to even consider being uh, approved for one of these visas. And so he received the visa, but uh, in order for him to actually leave and, and be able to come to the US, he ended up having to leave Iraq because it was too dangerous. Um, and so he had to spend uh, some time in Turkey. And, and during that time, you know, he wasn't able to work because he didn't know when he was going to leave, if he was going to be leaving. He didn't speak the language. And so, uh, you know, more or less what happened was he was there in Turkey waiting for his application to be processed. And during that time, he spent all of the money that he made working for the U.S. He ended up with zero dollars at the end of all this. Yeah. And so he's there and finally everything comes through and they say, okay, great. You know, you can buy your plane tickets and come to the U S well, he had no money. <laughs> and so, you know, he had to, he had to uh, reach out to some of the, the troops that he had worked with. Uh, some of the guys that were in the group that I, I was in um, ended up paying for his plane tickets. And so then, he, you know, he was able to get here um, but there was no, you know, if he didn't know any of us, uh, there would have been no welcoming party. There would have been no resources for him. He would have just shown up in the country, uh, alone, uh, just, you know, being left to, to figure things out on his own completely. Um, you know, luckily for him, there were, there were people here who he knew and he was still in contact with, and we were able to help him. But, um, hearing his story really kind of opened my eyes to, to the situation where I, you know, it made me realize that as, uh, you know, as the U.S., we weren't taking care of these wartime allies. We weren't making sure that they were taken care of once we left. Um, and so, you know, it bothered me at the time, but I didn't, it, even, even then that still wasn't enough for me to really start taking action on it. Um, it wasn't until 2016 when I got a message from one of the other interpreters who I'd worked with. So, um, like I said, I was in Iraq from 2004 to 2005. So in 2016, you know, 12 years later, <laughs> I'm finally hearing from one of these interpreters reaching out to me saying, Hey John, I need some help. You know, my, I'm still in danger. I'm living in hiding. My family is in danger. I need to leave Iraq. And so immediately I started trying to help him. And once I started trying to help him, I really, I really realized how bad the situation was. Um, because he, you know, he had actually applied for a visa all the way back in 2011. And, and actually his case is still pending. His application is still pending. Yeah, uh, it, it's unbelievable, and you know, and this is this is someone again who has has given uh, a lot for the for the cause. You know, he he worked with the U.S. for many many years, and um, you know, survived many things, overcome many challenges, made huge huge sacrifices for the U.S. Uh, but he can't even be considered to come to the US. He, he's not, his application isn't being heard. Um, and, and so what happened was, as, as I started trying to help him, and you know, and I'm trying everything, I'm calling people and, and, you know, sending emails and trying, you know, to do everything I can in my power to help him. I started hearing stories of other people who were in similar situations. And then, you know, I dig into it more. And then I find that, um, you know, there's tens of thousands of these interpreters between Iraq and Afghanistan who have been left behind, who are in the exact same situation, who have risked it all uh, for a country they may never have the chance to, to, to ever enter. Um, and we've just left them behind. And so that's what really kind of got me to start talking about this more. Uh, because when I started talking about it, again, you know, I, I had been kind of uh, exposed to this 
probably a lot more than the average person, but even even then, it, it didn't <laughs> it didn't actually hit me the 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 gravity of of this didn't really hit me until uh, my friend reached out to me in 2016, and I started trying to help him. And then at that point, that's when things changed, and I realized that this was a huge problem. It, it was much larger than just this one person, my my one friend that I was trying to help there's tens of thousands of these people uh, who are in the same situation that, you know, again, they're still, still in danger. Most of them are still living in hiding. Um, they're seen as traitors by the people that they live uh, with. Uh, and, and then they're also um, targeted by the insurgents. And so it's, it's like they're kind of out in no man's land and, and they've just been kind of forgotten and yeah this is for me it's really strange i mean i would expect if i help you in important things and then i get in danger because of that i would expect that you take care for me at least what you can and you know when i apply for a visa as this person that i mean you need it now and not in 10 years you know yeah so it just doesn't go into my mind the logic of, of people, or are we become so hard in the heart? I, I mean, where is the compassion? Not in only compassion, it's also responsibility. If you use a person for your services and you think, okay, uh, they get some money for it, but then you don't realize that it's not a normal work relationship where people live and they can choose to go there or there or whatever, but that they do it in life-threatening circumstances and you think, okay, now we go. You can do what you want. I mean, America was always considered a highly moral country. I get ever more doubts <laughs> when you tell me that. Yeah, it's very, it, it just breaks my heart. Um, and so, so, and I've been telling this story to, to anyone who will listen because I think it's important for people to hear this. Uh, and, and the reactions that I get are just amazing because the average person can't even believe it. They can't fathom that this would even be possible. And they, they, the, the average person is very compassionate, I think, to this. Uh, yeah, and the administrations, they seem to be disconnected from their human feelings or from their humanity, but just see people as numbers on the on the paper or something. It yes. reminds me very much on, on yeah on war times, yeah. Maybe that's the connection that you don't you don't have the normal perception of what life really means and that eh, especially if there are other people or oh, you know. But we are all a little bit guilty of that because we don't think about it. And as you said in this, um, your friend said in this little video, nobody, it's not in his eyes, he said, it's not a question of missing compassion of most people, not the, the authorities, I would say, but uh, the people who just ignore it, they just didn't know, doesn't, don't know. And I didn't know before that, oh yeah, they need interpreters. What, what happens to interpreters when the, the 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 employers go away w what happens i mean for me it would be natural to take them with you you know right when you go away with uh, and at least offer them to go, go with you instead of saying ciao bye bye <laughs> right right yeah and, and i think that's it i think it's you know you make that offer you make that available uh and that's not being done and and really um it's it's a very sad situation and actually in 2018 there were only two interpreters uh, who were granted visas from Iraq to come to the US. Um, and again, there's tens of thousands of these people that are still out there. Um, and to me, it's just, it's unimaginable. It's um, a scandal, I would say. It scandal. is, yeah. it really is. And, and, and I know that, you know, if given the option, I think, uh, I, I don't, I mean, I don't know why anyone would want to stay um, in danger and keep themselves and, and their families and, and things like that in danger. Um, you know, I think, I think all of them would want to leave. 
you know, um, and, and maybe it's not to the US, but maybe it's to another country. Yeah. Um, but for yeah. this, we uh, uh, in Germany, we have this refugee law, you know, when there is danger for life. And then you, the German uh, country has said that they would be accepted. It is changing now because, you know, uh, there are all sorts of people coming and not only because of uh, danger for life, but then uh, there is the risk to, to not, to not um, see anymore the real reasons and not help people who really, really, really badly need help. I mean, even people who are starving at home and need uh, to survive, that's also a reason to go away, in my opinion. But oh, yeah. uh, uh, where being killed is even a level more. And so if you are in danger to be killed, I think every, how can I say, uh, every country, I wanted to say moral countries, but I come to the belief <laughs> that countries are not moral anymore, that our governments have nothing to do with morality, just with, I don't know, better status, earn more, be more powerful or something. But that's my personal belief. But I think really every country should do everything to, to help these people. But you know, I'm a little bit negative in this uh, thing. I don't think our governments want to help people. They have different agendas, but. Well, right, and, and I think, unfortunately, I think the only way that it will change is through change in legislation. I think that that's the only way it will change because I think that um, right now, what, it, what what's holding things up, it's, it's all of these immigration policies and, and the way that things are done that that's what's going on but again if you ask the average person you know how they feel about these things they'll tell you that they think that um you know these people should be granted some sort of uh asylum and and uh you know be taken care of and and so um there's a disconnection between between the public and, and between the laws the immigration policies that are out there right now and what and that's why I'm talking about this. Yeah, and that's why I'm talking about it because I think that um, in talking to people, I've realized that there is this disconnection. I, I know that you know um, when I tell this these stories, the average person says, "Wow, I had no idea. How can I help?" That's that's imme their immediate reaction, and and so um, that that leads me to believe that you know there are people out there who do care about this and 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 feel the same way I do about it that you know we should protect protect mm -hmm. these people and, and so i mean i i always tell everyone you know look i think the only way this is going to change is if enough people make their voices heard and yeah. so um, you're doing petitions out. here in for instance in germany many uh, things are influenced by petitions by many many people signing petitions and then maybe something uh, changes for instance when they want to send back um young people who were already born in germany but had a uh, 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 foreign parents and then they want to expel them and then the people around them create petitions and sometimes it happens that they are that they can stay you know so do you do something like that yes yes uh, so there's a couple of petitions right now that i'm working on um, and uh, you know and i just i i tell everyone i say you know look contact your elected officials and explain to them how you feel um, and tell them you know you believe that it's important for us to protect these refugees you know and not necessarily just these interpreters but i think on on a larger scale there's a lot of people out there right now that um we could help who yeah. need help um, but i think yeah i think it i think it starts with with the people who you know are our allies i mean <laughs> that's the obvious one you know it's like okay these people have already given something let's give them a little bit of a priority but i think there's you know beyond that um there is a larger problem there's there's larger problems out there that that need solutions and uh, yeah and then by yeah. fear that you that you get uh, terrorists or something like this in the country there might be a small part but you have enough forces to to figure that out the rest of the people wants to do the work 
they need to do to, to survive. They want to contribute to, they want to, to, to be integrated, the majority, I would say, you know, if you allow it to them, if you say, no, you have to live yes. over there, then it doesn't happen, no? I, yep, I completely agree with all that, you know, and I tell people that from what I've seen, you know, if, if I was someone wanting to do malicious things, <laughs> I, I, I would, you would never be able, you know, it would make no sense for you to try to do it legally and go through this process. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like if I was going to do something bad, I would not apply to be a refugee like that. You know, it, it just, it doesn't make any sense. And so, yes, there may be a very, very small number of people that could come in that way, but I don't think honestly, uh, given the circumstances that anyone again, who would be wanting to do something malicious like that would, would, go through that and so. you know, for, the, for the possibility that maybe one percent uh, is uh, has malicious thoughts then to exclude 99 percent from the opportunity that's just not a, a, a sane reasoning it's, it's just no not, no it is not valid so not at all not yeah. at all no no and, and really you know the, the people that i know uh who i've personally met who i've personally worked with um are just very kind people, very simple people. Um, I don't really think that, you know, I, I think their main aspirations are taking care of their families. And um, that's, that's about it. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think uh, the, the, the risk of opening up um, the possibility for these people to come is very small. Um, but I do think the reward is very high because I think that by doing that, I think you you do start building trust and relationships uh, with those people and those countries. And, and I think that, you know, in the end, that would have a, a very positive effect. Yeah, absolutely. And then I think also... I think I'm always talking about my own opinion that American America as a country has lost a lot of trustworthiness in the last decades. And yes. so to make it worse in this way and show that you are really behaving in an immoral way, leave your allies in, in the sand, in the mud, that's not bettering the image America has in the world because it's really in the downfall. And um, I, I think if there is not a real big change, America will sooner or later lose the imperial power it has still, you know? But behaving yeah. in this way, like the absolute king did in the past times, that's a secure way to being falling down from the throne. <laughs> Absolutely. It is. I mean, you know, I, I think if you don't have trust, um, you know, how, how are you going to have any allies? That you, you know, why, why would anyone want to trust you? And so, um, yeah, yeah. Until, you, until you have still enough power and still America has enough power. Oh, sure. To use the power to do that. But as soon as the power, they get a little bit weaker, everybody says, bye bye. <laughs> Yes, right, so it's in, exactly. in the own interest of America to, to make a more trustworthy uh, um, image in the world instead of what they are doing, I'm really, 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 really very... I'm not really a p political person, but I see uh, what, what, what is happening and I think it's not the right way to, to treat each other, let's say, also inside of America, you know, the, the, the right and the left and these and that, and that's, that's, come on, that's not a way to, yes. to live, so. Uh, yeah, I agree. There's a lot of separation and uh, a lot of fear. And yeah, and a lot of hate and a lot of accusation and a lot of the unwillingness to embrace each other and to find the things which you have in common. Instead, you find something which is separating you and then you get all the blame uh, on the other one. And what does the other one? It blames back. So that's, that's war. That's a tactic of war and not of peace. And you know, yes. when you do it inside your own country, you imagine what you would do with other countries, you know, so. <laughs> Yeah. You see, I'm really, I'm really, I'm getting excited <laughs> about these things because they are so against my worldview of 
trying to, to, to create peace and understanding and embracing uh, humans and assuming uh, to, that humans are willing to take care for, for each other, at least for the families. And, so, and that all these things happen, not all, but most of them for misunderstandings. And even the people who do evil things, normally they do it because of their own evil uh, experiences. Yes. So if we could, un, un, how do you say, undo or heal the drama, personal drama of every trauma uh, of everybody who, who has become a bad person, you know, instead of pushing them more and more into a corner and making others bad by that and giving them the label, that's not the solution of the problems of the world in all levels, not in the personal, not in a couple relationship, not, a fam not in the family, not in the community, not in a region, nation, and between the nations. It's all the wrong way of trying to live in this world. And that's why it looks like it looks. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, I completely agree. And I, this is just one small uh, example of that, I think. Yeah, um, but the a situation very, very of, of a larger, yes, yes. And so, I, I, yeah, I completely agree. <laughs> yeah. But then we are left here uh, as little ones, and we don't know how we can help, except of doing things like that, trying to reach other people to get aware of it, and maybe sooner or later engage, you know, how I did now after having heard this in, in uh, Africa, I now am collecting money for uh, refugee children from refugee families who cannot pay to go to school because the school costs, and they are so poor that they cannot pay to, to go to school. And so I have already collected and I continue to collect money and I might uh, put uh, the, the um, link also to this video because you can do very much with very little money, you know? Yeah, and absolutely. Do something and imagine a child who cannot go to school, feels excluded. You can imagine what the, the future is when they have no education no way of socializing and, and growing by learning. What future do they have, you know? So that's where the, all these ISIS and, 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 and people recruit uh, um, their, their followers, you know? People who are right. full of uh, disappointment and full of feeling to be neglected and to be un, unseen, unheard unimportant and then the rage is psychological truth no there comes the rage and then there comes the will to destroy those you of whom you think they are responsible for them for that but it's not necessarily you and me it's somebody else but still maybe you get killed because of that because somebody is white male or something <laughs> sure right right exactly right no i i agree i agree it's uh it's a mess, really. But I, I, yeah, I do think that there is hope because, like I said, I, as I talk to people, as I talk to individuals like yourself, uh, most people are, are, are compassionate to those human things. Yes. They really are. Um, but on the larger level, I think there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, a lot of work. Um, and so... That's here. Yeah. It starts yeah. here. And then we, we need to find a way to to amplify this sort of uh, consciousness we are having, we are creating in others, and then find a way for action. I don't know what it is. I don't think it's much protest in the sense of shouting. I don't think it's that. No, no, I don't think it is. <laughs> no, no I, I don't think it is either. Um, but, you know, I, th I think right now, one of the big hurdles, especially with the, like uh, these interpreters, is that there's actually policies that are preventing and systems that are preventing them to be able to to get to safety and to be protected and um you know i think that the, there needs to be work with that and, and just looking again kind of in general at, at the idea of uh you know refugees 
immigration, even tourism. I, I know that it's it's very hard. Like I said, I, I work with musicians from around the world, and it's very hard for a lot of these musicians to even be able to enter the U.S. Uh, to come and share their culture and and, and spread uh, you know their music, uh, which I think is an important thing because I think you know again the United States is a country of immigrants. You know, a lot of a lot of the folks here, uh, you know, and they have ties to other countries and other cultures, uh, but we're disconnected from them. And and a lot of the the current immigration uh, policies make it difficult for these people who are living in other countries to come again and share uh, those cultures here. And so I've I've been, I've run into a lot of situations here within the last couple of years where. Uh, musicians will have their visas denied uh, or delayed or you know they, it just being put into very difficult situations uh, which seems just unbelievable to me because I mean they're, they're they're literally just coming in trying to to entertain people and just spread their culture share their songs share their stories and uh, to me you know again that's a big piece of I think uh, solving some of these problems i think you know uh being able to to have people exposed to these ideas to be able to meet people from other parts of the world exactly sharing experiences yeah all of that is very important i think in the big picture yeah. um and so yeah again I, I think there's kind of a big picture problem and then there's these smaller problems within there that uh yeah Right now, I think a lot of it is 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 in the policies that we have, and I, that's why I say to everyone that I talk to, I say, you know, talk to talk to the people that you've elected, uh, and tell them, you know, how you feel about it, because I think that that's where it starts, at least right now. Um, or go into politics yourself. Or go into <laughs> politics yourself, right? Yeah, I guess that you could do that too, but I don't think the average person wants to. It's no, but at least go there if that is the possibility to talk with a, a, a how do you say uh, in English? Yeah, the people you have voted for, and yes, and, yeah. and talk to them and uh, tell them what you know, what you learned about that. They don't know either. They. They no, but most of them don't know. It, it's exactly. it's not well known, right? Yeah. No, right. People aren't talking about it. And as yeah. people, as humans, they will be touched by that too. And maybe then they will find a, a, a way whenever they can to 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 get into that, you know. And do you uh, are you sort of creating a hub for for people? Do you have a website or a, a email or how can they contact you and? Uh, when they have questions yeah well i have uh so there's a website it's called no one left uh no one left behind it, it, so it's no one left n o o n e l e f t dot org no one left dot org um and that's part of an organization called no one left behind and this is specifically mm -hmm. for the interpreters mm -hmm. um and you can go there and you can learn more about the situation and then there's also a link on there that says get involved that will allow you to to make donations um, and those donations go uh, towards helping interpreters once they get to the US uh, you know buying clothes furniture food uh, getting them a place to live all of those things um, and, and then there's also a link on there for people to contact uh, their elected officials and um, it's it's a very easy thing that you just put in your zip code and it will immediately uh, determine who who your elected officials are, and then it allows you to put it together a message um, that you can send them, uh, and then it also has contact information so you can call and follow up. Um, and that's that's kind of a, where I where I usually try to send people to start with this, mm -hmm. um, because most of the information is there. You know, when you say when people when the interpreters come and they have to buy food and you have to help them, private people have to help them to set foot into the country, start a new life. That should be the task of the government because exactly. they have worked for you. And now <laughs> exactly. they, they, they really uh, like a sort of a pension. They need to get the... It's unbelievable. Yeah, but that is, that is the case. That's, that's absolutely... <clears throat> yeah. That's good. 
That's absurd. I I know. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, but that is, that's the truth. That's, that's how it is. Um, you know, paying for flights, paying for all of those things once they arrive, figuring all of that out is on, on the individual. That's, that's, that's um, absurd. That's really absurd. You have to yeah. recognize that they have worked for you. And, and now, no, okay, I don't want I to... Know, I know, I know. We could, we, we could talk for hours on that because it is, it, it is absurd. It really is. These things. Um, you know, there good. are, there are a lot of churches that are helping. Um, I've talked to a lot of churches. Yeah, okay, but it's the state. No, but again, it's, it's yes, 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 yes. And yes, the there's state a, who <laughs> needs to have them, not the churches. Exactly. Well, and I agree. And that's, uh, that's what I'm saying. I think, you know, uh, the average person doesn't realize that, though, that um, the resources out there are, are really coming from individuals. And so I, and I guess that's why I, I'm speaking about this and trying to get individuals engaged is because um, I think that there is this perception that, um, you know, there's these big entities out there, the government, or big organizations out there that are helping these people. But uh, in the reality of it, there, yes, there are some things, but there, there's very little. There's, there's very, very little, especially in the terms of these interpreters who, again, they've given everything um, for the U.S., but now they've just been completely abandoned. And so, um, yeah, not, not only are they not being granted access to the United States, but they're also, if they, if they are, you know, if they happen to be lucky enough to be granted access, they are completely on their own. They're, they're paying for their own plane tickets. They're, they're figuring things out once they get to the U.S. all on their own. And there's no help. They, the only help and the only opportunity for help that they have is through individuals. Um, well. So, okay. so yes, so, so, and that's why, again, I, I, I'm urging individuals to reach out uh, and say, look, you know, reach out to the government and say, look, you know, we need to be supporting these people. Um, you know, they, they have given a lot for us. We need to give something to them. And, you know, it, it would be a very small thing that I think would have a huge impact. And, and again, it spread a larger message of, you know, uh, this idea of, of taking care of each other um, and, and kind of more of the human element of all of this, yeah. you know, not just yeah. the numbers on a page and, and, and things like that. It's that, that, that to me isn't what it's all about. And so, so much needed. Yeah. I thank you for needed. reaching out and letting oh, me know you. about these things because I really didn't. And I, as you see, I'm really, uh, <laughs> emotional about that and me too i, I am it. too <laughs> yeah. it, it, it bothers me but you know uh, it also uh i think you can turn that pain into something uh something useful yeah. and that's what i'm trying to do that's um, so good it's a very 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 good uh how can you say purpose which you are uh, pursuing that's i think that's what we need to do try to help others who without their own how do you say their own uh, guilt i don't want to talk about guilt but not because of them they are in a situation which is just not right just not right so yeah yep so thank you very 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 much and um thank you when, when you want to talk again with uh, one of these interpreters it would be nice to hear first-hand experience and uh maybe we can do more thank you very absolutely. much absolutely i would yeah i would love to so thank you very much okay thank you yep thank bye you bye.